Life Stories Live. Hello everyone, it's good to have you with us again for another Life Stories Worldwide broadcast on Zoom, on Facebook and on YouTube. So it's going out live and we encourage you to tell your friends about this, tell your family to watch this story tonight. If you need any help, if you need a prayer, if you need any contact, please go to our hotline you see on your screen, plus 44794355 You can phone, WhatsApp or text, and someone will get back as soon as possible to you to help you. You can also go to our website at lifestoriesworldwide.com. There you can find out lots of information about all the different broadcasts that are going on through Life Stories. Last week we were in Florida, but we're back in the UK tonight. And we have a speaker tonight from Hampshire in the UK. Tonight we have uh, Robert Conway with us. Uh, just to check, Robert, um, for 30 years he had a career as a global corporate finance leader for the technology industry. And after that, he co-founded uh, Parable Trust, a non-profit company uh, which operates on Christian principles. And the trust helps to grow and, and develop businesses that transform communities and create value to help the poor and needy internationally. A tremendous work that Robert has been doing, and he's going to share his story with you tonight. So I'm going to hand over to Robert now. Robert Conway. Thanks, Robert. Alan, thank you very much. And uh, it's a privilege and a joy to be with you all tonight. Uh, I'm going to share a little bit about my testimony. Uh, I'm 70 years old, celebrated that last year. Uh, but I'm a re relative babe in, in, the, in the Lord. I didn't come to faith until I was 43. So uh, I'm going to spend some time just talking about the amazing thing that uh, God woke me up with at that time uh, and then share some of the things he's done with me since then. Uh, but I thought it might be helpful just for a few minutes to explain a bit about my background before I came to face uh, and what a probably a waste of time I was in my early years and not a very good scholar and didn't do great things. But God can take people, he can take the we, he can take the, uh, the poor and transform. And I'm just so grateful. I'm, Tonight, I just want to give him all the honour, glory and praise in what I share. Uh, it's not about me, it's about him. But uh, So I was born uh, in Bexter Heath in Kent in 1951, uh, soon after the Second World War. Uh, my father uh, was a glazier. He had a glass business, which did very well. Um, he was taken off to fight the war in Japan in the Second World War. So my mother was left to, to run the business and to deal with all the bombs that were landing near Woolwich Arsenal and put the glass back in. So uh, I'm very grateful that my mother and father, and in fact, one night she left the business uh, and half an hour after she left, the bomb landed on it and blew it up. And uh, if she hadn't been out there, I wouldn't be here sharing this testimony tonight. So, you know, God has a wonderful plan and purpose, isn't he? And I give thanks to them. But they were not believers. They had no faith. Uh, I wasn't brought up in a Christian household. I didn't know anything about uh, Christianity, and to be honest, I didn't care. Uh, I was a lazy, immature teenager who did all the things that teenagers shouldn't do. I wasn't a good scholar. I scraped some O-levels, some A-levels. Uh, wasn't good enough grades to get into university that I had. Um, somehow, uh, I managed to get a, an opportunity through the clearing system and went to university in Salford, uh, where I studied, studied economics. Uh, but I wasted that opportunity. I spent my life enjoying rock music and organising all the entertainment rock concerts there. Um, so not a good student. Uh, didn't really know what I wanted to do in life. My final year, I went to the careers people, did an aptitude test. In those days, there weren't laptops and things like that where you could do the answers. It was uh, all these questions and you put a pin in. And then you go back two weeks later and they say, you should be an accountant. And I won't repeat the language I used at that time, but it was effectively no way, Jose. Uh, I was not going to be an accountant. That was boring. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be in the rock industry and I, I tried to get a job. I applied for 54 jobs and got nowhere. And then in 1972, three things happened in three days. Uh, it was the Thursday and I got my degree, which I didn't deserve. I think in, in English terms, in slang, they call it a tutu. Uh, I should be very careful what I say after 
Dear Desmond has gone to glory recently, but a 2-2 was a pretty mediocre degree, and I didn't deserve it, to be honest. Uh, on the uh, Friday, I did get a job interview uh, with the Civic Hall of Presswich Corporation in Manchester. And uh, they actually offered me a job to become an assistant manager there to help them with their events. And on the Saturday, I got married to my lovely wife, Sue, uh, who I met at university. She was a nurse. And uh, this year coming up, we celebrate our golden wedding anniversary, 50 years together. And uh, we've been blessed with four children, uh, nine grandchildren. Uh, sadly, we lost two. We've had a football team of 11, but uh, two died within two weeks of being, uh, being born. But uh, So we've had our ups and downs in life, like everybody. Uh, but we are very grateful for what we have and what we've got. So that's that's a little bit about me. Um, I realised actually that the aptitude test was probably right after about a, a year doing what I was doing in the entertainment industry, and I was enjoying the finance side of things. So it was a bit of a wake up call, and I recognised I needed to get a proper qualification, and I went and pursued what was in those days called articles. We become a clerk, an article clerk to a firm of accountants in Manchester, where I was then. And in those days, the firms were charging you £500 to get articles. They didn't pay you, you paid them to be trained. Uh, very Dickensian. And it was a Dickensian kind of office with ledgers and dust and pencils and rubbers. And that was the environment I was brought up in. But I was greatly blessed. Uh, I managed, I failed my first exam, so I was trying to do it with a correspondence course. We just had our first child and studying at home after a day's work with a baby in the house was not the easiest thing to do. I uh, failed my first exam, uh, but managed to sort myself out. I paid to have uh, proper training as opposed to correspondence training, and I did pass my exams eventually. Uh, and in fact, I got a prize in my final exam, so that was that was fortunate. But it was a challenge, and in those days, we had uh, yeah we had just had our second child, Claire, our our, our daughter then. And normally when people qualified as accountants, they often went overseas for a couple of years to get international training. But that wasn't really an option for us with two small children. Um, so I did the next best thing and applied to join a, a big firm of accountants. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to get a job with Price Waterhouse in Southampton in those days. Uh, and that was in 1977. And that was challenging. It was uh, very career uh, orientated hard work, long hours, promotions. You either got promotions because you did well or you were, you were out. It was an up or out kind of environment. But I managed to knuckle down, even though we had four, four children in five years at that point in time. able to get promoted through and I got in, admitted to the partnership in 1986 
um, which was a wonderful thing. And uh, I just enjoyed my work. I really did. I was very fortunate, worked with some great people, some great clients. Uh, and at the end of the 80s, I started getting involved with corporate finance and helping people buy and sell companies. And some people will know there were quite a lot of uh, management buyouts around in those days in businesses. And I got involved in advising and helping management buyouts in the late 80s and early 90s and uh, very successful. I thought my life was sorted. Everything was great. Uh, I was enjoying my work. Uh, and then I found out my wife had this terrible debilitating disease called ME. Uh, and I'm no doctor, but uh, and I wouldn't even be able to pronounce it, but it's a fatiguing disease. It's called myologic, and this is where I've struggled with the second word, this is like a long Greek name, but it, it's essentially a, a debilitating fatigue. Um, and we had great private health. Uh, we were able to go and see the best doctors trying to get diagnosis and treatment and all sorts of things, and nobody could do anything for her. And uh, at that point in time, we had four teenage children. Uh, I was a workaholic and I also became an alcoholic. I worked long hours, I worked hard, I played hard and I drank too much. And to be honest, I couldn't cope with coming home, seeing my wife and the teenage children. It was just not good and I wasn't good. And I came home late one night, it was a Wednesday evening, uh, about nine o'clock, kids were in bed, I saw my wife and she said, um, a friend suggested going to this uh, meeting on Sunday um, in, uh, in Romsey, which is just down the road. Uh, they meet at a, a comprehensive school, the Mountbatten School, and uh, they, it's a healing ministry, I was told. What, what's that? Uh, didn't understand it, knew nothing about it. Uh, I said, well, we tried all sorts of things with the doctors. Um, I'm not sure what this is about, but you can't drive. I'll be your taxi driver. So on the Sunday, uh, I got in the car, I drove her to this meeting and we got into this school hall Sunday afternoon. There must have been about 200 people in there uh, and there were people playing music and singing. And I didn't understand all these people were waving their arms in the air and dancing around and doing things that I thought, what is this? This is crazy. It was almost it was before I'm a celebrity. Get me out of here. So I went, sat on the back row listened for a while, observed, then they did the offering. And I said, all they are, they're after your money. These words have come back to haunt me many times later, I can assure you, but I'm telling it like it is. That's what happened at that point in 1994. And then after about an hour, there was a, a lady pastor and she called forward anybody that uh, was suffering with ME for prayer. And my wife went forward and uh, the pastor laid hands on her. And for the first time in my life, and I don't know why, I started to pray. I didn't know what I was doing, but the hands came on her. She received the Holy Spirit and a miraculous healing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And she fell in the spirit onto the floor and we spoke. And she said, I'm okay. I said, really? Yes, I'm okay. And she was seeing doctors every Tuesday. They were giving her injections and stuff, which weren't doing a lot of good. And she was due to go back to see the doctor the following Tuesday, which she did. And he did various readings, tests, bloods, all that kind of stuff, and said, you're healed. Everything is all right. Hallelujah. And at that point in time, from at the age of 43, with absolutely no belief, no faith, no nothing, I knew there was a living God. And that he died for my wife. Had he died for me? I wasn't quite sure, but I knew there was something and I had to explore further. And that summer, the, the healing ministry met every three weeks on a Sunday. So it wasn't like a church fellowship. And we had some good friends in the village where we live and they invited us to come along to their local church in, in Andover, the town. I, I won't say dominant denomination because that is irrelevant. Uh, but we went in, it was in a, it, it wasn't a grand, lovely, beautiful architect built building. It was like a shed. I called it a scout hut, if you like, one of the corrugated room, very simple. But as soon as I walked in there, I felt the love of God. It just pervaded everything. And it was like, like coming home almost. I felt that I was coming home. And uh, that summer, it was in August, I think, of 1994. And they uh, used to meet every 
Sunday morning and every Sunday night, but because it was August, they didn't have Sunday night meetings. But one uh, one Sunday that month, they had all the churches together in the town met in the local guild hall, and I went along to that meeting, uh, and there was a call for um, to come to Jesus, uh, and our, our pastor was there, and I went forward, received the Holy Spirit, gave my life to Jesus, and my life was changed there and then. I was on a journey, uh, complete transformation and searching. Yeah, it took me a while because I felt I was, you know, here I am. Uh, I was 43. But when you come to Christ, you're born again. You're a new creation and uh, you're born again, but your mind isn't renewed. And I was in all sorts of states like a babe, not knowing what to do next. Uh, I was doing well in business. I thought advising on management buyouts, mergers and acquisitions would make me lots of money. And as a Christian, I shouldn't be, shouldn't be doing that. I should give it all up and go and help the poor and needy in Africa and uh, get on my bike and help people. Uh, but actually, God had a much better plan, which I didn't know about. And it was two years later, 1996, I happened to be uh, president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants in the south of England for that year. And we had a uh, black tie dinner in the local hotel, which the great and the good came to. It was about 600 people, black, uh, black tie dinner. And uh, as president, I had the uh, opportunity to invite. Uh, normally the local bishop comes along and says a very kind of straightforward grace. Thank you for the food, Lord. But uh, I invited our minister, who was full of the Holy Spirit. And he gave a, a mini preach for three minutes, uh, at which point, one of the guests of Lloyd's Bank, who I got to sponsor the dinner, raised his hand and shouted, Hallelujah! In front of 600 business people in a room. Wow, what is going on here? And after the dinner speech is finished, and I said my little bit, uh, he came forward and introduced himself. And he was a wonderful man called Pat Kellard. Uh, some people might know him. I don't I see you nodding, Alan. Hallelujah. And uh, Matt, uh, Pat was a wonderful wonderful man of God. Didn't know anything about him. He was very polite. I just shared that I was a relatively new Christian, what I was doing in business. He said, come and visit me next week, will you? Hi Stories Live. Uh, he had a business down in Dorset, not very far away, an hour's drive. He was in Bland for four and then company called Blake Hill, you're a place from the electronics industry. Uh, and he said, just come down, we have a ball meeting on a Wednesday, join us for lunch and uh, we'll share a few things. So I, I got down there and I thought, oh, I might get some business out of it. Uh, he might want to buy and sell a company or something. And of course, how naive was I? Uh, and I went there and Pat was uh, got a couple of brothers together over lunch. And of course, the ball meeting wasn't a ball meeting. It was a prayer meeting. And they shared about the call in the marketplace prayed about the business, prayed for their staff, prayed about the contracts they were going after. Everything that they did and every decision they made in the business was soaked in prayer. And that was a complete revelation to me. And Pat turned out to be a wonderful mentor. In fact, I called him Uncle Pat. Um, uh, and, and, and he helped to show me and believed and spoke a prophecy over my life that it was a calling for me to serve Jesus Christ in the marketplace and to go into the dark boardrooms of the company and to share the gospel where people don't go and where mammon, mammon reigns. And, and to me, that was an amazing change. And Pat invited me, he was on the board of the International Christian Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and he invited Sue and I, my wife, to a meeting in, in Sweden that year. And uh, we were beginning to learn so much about the call in the marketplace. And it was exciting. And it took me a while. At that point in time, Pricewaterhouse uh, was going through a mega merger with Coopers and Lybrand. It had become Pricewaterhouse Coopers. And I was promoted rapidly. I, I, I didn't deserve it, probably like I didn't deserve to get what I did at, in, my, in my education. Uh, but I got promoted through to become a global leader for the technology industry across both Pricewaterhouse and Coopers. So I was pretty busy traveling the world uh on planes i was talking to bill earlier on about san diego which i visited and other places i was forever traveling uh and knew that um you know i was in the bible i was reading the word etc but nothing really changed and 
it got to 2000 and I felt a compelling need to actually seek transformation change. So I took a, a day, I phoned Uncle Pat Kellard and said, can I come and see you? And uh, he was gracious enough to give me uh, a day with him. And we just sat down and uh, he prayed. He gave me some words. He gave me some scriptures. He said, just go for three days and meditate on these scriptures. Soak in them and see what the Lord does. And uh, they're in the book, which I can share with people later. I won't go through them now. But it was a real significant time. And it got to the third night and I was reading, reading the word and I just heard the Holy Spirit very quietly saying, go to Nineveh. Go to Nineveh? What's all that about? And of course, it's Jonah, isn't it? And Jonah, Nineveh was a trading center that was going the wrong way. And actually, my interpretation was, I believe the Holy Spirit was telling me to come out of where I was in Price Waterhouse Coopers and to come and serve him in the marketplace. And I continue to meditate and reflect on those words. At that point in time, I, as I said, I had a global job. Uh, I'd moved my office to London when I wasn't overseas. And I got the train from Andover to London one morning. And I always did my daily reading in the Bible on that 50-minute uh, train journey. Uh, but the Lord spoke to me and he gave me five significant scriptures in the space of a 30-minute train journey. Uh, and it led me to realize that he'd given me a vision to start to develop businesses for the kingdom of God. It was a call, Parable of the Talents was one of them, about taking the talents which we've all got, using them, multiplying them, um, together with the Parable of the Sower, how we do that, how we transform, how we help people. And I knew at that point in time, it was really the time to step out, and to step out in faith and to serve him. And, um, leaving a partnership is not a straightforward thing. There are several thousand partners around the world. It's a long-term commitment. You don't go on three months' notice. I had lots of clients that needed to look after those properly, hand them over, etc. So I agreed a three-year transition plan to come out of where I was and to step out in faith and to serve him in the marketplace. Uh, and the Lord is continuing refining us, isn't he? At that point in time, I thought everything would come together very straightforward. All the dots would be joined up. Um, I did what Robert has done in the past and sadly can do again. I call it Frank Sinatra. I often start off doing things my way and not God's way. And my way was to go around, network, see people, think I could convince people to kind of give their businesses to God and do other things like that, etc. And of course, that led to nothing. Uh, and it got to uh, a year before I was I was leaving the partnership, and I went to um, the ICC International Ch Christian Chamber of Commerce annual conference in Coventry, and it turned out it was the last conference that Pat Kellar was to speak at before he went to glory. Uh, Pat had had cancer before earlier on in the around 2000 2001 and had healing at the time, but it had come back in 2004. Uh, he went to glory in uh, December 2005. So it was wonderful. I didn't know it was his last meeting, but it was wonderful to see Pat again. I hadn't seen him for a little while. Uh, but there were some other significant people there that God had brought together that I just didn't know. There was a, an Argentinian pastor that some of you may have come across, a guy called Victor Lorenzo. Victor was responsible for the big, uh, amongst other uh, Argentinian leaders in the uh, revival in the uh, in the late 90s in Argentina. He led a church of 80,000 people. Uh, but God called him to just leave the pulpit, to leave the church and to come to London and to serve him in the marketplace. And he let everything go in faith. He walked the streets of London and just started praying on London Bridge, underground and other places. And uh, Victor was speaking at that conference. Um, there was another guy, Philip Louis, who was on the then board of the uh, ICCC UK, who had his own consulting business. And God told me to go, go and introduce myself to him. And, and Philip's reaction was, why do I want to speak to somebody else as a consultant? This is, this is no good. So, but actually, there was a, a divine connection there. And things began to happen in that final 12 months. Um, in, um, as I said, Pat Callar went to glory in December 2004. 
uh, I had been uh, helping his um, managing director, Derek Gaston, um, felt that Derek was isolated, particularly during Pat's sickness. So I, I took a day out a month ago and just support Derek in prayer and to help him talk. I probably wasn't much for help, to be honest, but had somebody to talk to. Um, Life Stories Live.